If you weren't awake before, <laughs> you certainly are now. Um, uh, I am from Kansas City, Missouri, in the U.S., and uh, flew in yesterday morning, took kind of the red eye to get here, so I'll be here in beautiful Oslo for uh, uh, another day or so, and then I'll be flying back home. But uh, when I was contacted by uh, Creative Mornings, they invited me to come and talk about Die November and some of the things that Die November uh, that kind of led to the creation of Die November and uh, some of the reason why I think that um, it caught on the way that it did. Um, but when they invited me to speak, I was uh, thrilled to come. I had never been to Norway, um, and so I appreciate everybody uh, being so welcoming and friendly. Um, and uh, most of what I knew about your fine country came from um, the fox or, <laughs> or uh, troll hunter. So. I made a little um, Dino Hunter poster uh, in honor of that, but um, it's just as snowy as it is in the film, so, um, so that was good. But um, how many of you had heard of Dino November before, before today? Okay. And uh, how many of you, do any of you have kids of your own? Or uh, seems like kind of a young crowd, but okay. Great, good. Uh, well, I wanted to uh, first talk a little bit about Die November, kind of how it came to be, the genesis of it, and uh, then move into talking about some of the some of what we're trying to do with our own kids. Um, that uh, really was sort of the uh, the impetus for starting what we're doing with these dinosaurs. Um, so, uh, my children, I have four children. Um, I have a six-year-old, a five-year-old, a two-year-old, and a three-month-old. Uh, the three-month-old is why my wife, Susan, who, is, uh, who started Die November with me, that's why she's not here. Uh, three-month-olds don't generally do very well on 12-hour flights. So um, we try very hard to um, help our children to feel like they are free to be creative and to use their imaginations and to hold on to that sense of wonder that is, uh, you know, kind of innate in a child that they're born with and that we lose over time, uh, unfortunately. Um, I have, my, my five-year-old especially, but um, really all of them, uh, they seem to already be very much, uh, I suppose, prone to uh, imagination and creativity, and uh, they come up with all sorts of bizarre and, and strange drawings and stories and songs and dances, um, all on their own without our encouragement. Um, so um, one, it, the explanation behind this picture, I, there's kind of an inside joke that I have with my kids. Uh, anytime we are, uh, when they ask a question, the answer usually has something to do with an aardvark. Um, what are we having for dinner? Well, we're having aardvark burgers. Um, what are we going to do today? We're going to uh, go to the zoo and pet the aardvarks. Um, and it got to the point where my five-year-old didn't think that aardvarks were real. They, she thought that I had made them up um, because it was just a joke to her. So she didn't realize that aardvarks were actually real creatures. And when you look at them, you can kind of understand why <laughs> she might think that they were, that they were imagined. Um, but, uh, oh, that is the wrong button. I messed up my slide, but that's okay, we're done with that one. <laughs> so in uh, November of 2012, my son was one year old at the time, and he was not sleeping through the night um, just about ever. So he would wake up two, three, sometimes four times every night for the first two years of his life. Uh, which meant that Susan and I were getting 
on average about three, four hours of sleep, broken up into you know hour and a half chunks um, throughout the night. So with two older kids, um, obviously my, my newborn wasn't around yet, but um, with our, our two older kids, we were exhausted during the day and uh, didn't have much left for them. And that was something that we really felt bad about. We didn't want our older girls to feel like they were kind of getting passed over because we had to spend so much energy on their new little brother. Um, I put together a, an equation to maybe help illustrate this a little bit. Um, four hours of sleep per night times 365 nights in a year times two years equals <laughs> equals zombies. And um, that is what we were. And we would wake up because we had to, because our kids would wake up at you know six, seven o'clock in the morning, uh, because that's just what they do. Um, and we would have to get up and make them breakfast and get them ready for school and get them off, uh, you know, and then go to work and do all those normal things. Um, we really wanted to find a way to reconnect with our kids. Um, we began relying quite a bit on technology to kind of do our parenting for us because we were so exhausted, and. This stuff, it, iPads, Netflix, uh, you know, you name it, it's wonderful for parents to have uh, as a tool to entertain their kids and, and get some time to ourselves. Um, and really, it's a great source of storytelling for kids, being able to watch movies and TV shows without having to, you know, be at a specific time or, um, you know, if anybody even remembers how TV used to work when we were kids, you know, you kind of just had to turn it on and you got what you got. Well, now we can pick what they watch and we can kind of be a little bit more selective about the quality of, of their entertainment. So this is great stuff. Um, technology is great. Um, I don't know what we would do without it, but it can begin to become a real crutch for parents and even for individuals just in, in our own lives. Um, and that's really where we were at. We were putting them in front of the TV or putting them down with a, uh, an iPad to play video games instead of really interacting with them. And, and uh, you know, we noticed they were playing less by themselves. They were doing, you know, fewer imagination games. Um, and that was, you know, that really was, was something that we felt, that we felt, you know, disappointed with. You know, we, we didn't want that for them. Um, we really wanted to find a way that we could reconnect with them, get them excited again, and something that we could be involved with um, in their lives so that we could you know, do something together. And that's really what led to uh, Dynovember. Um, my wife was the one who actually um, stumbled on these dinosaur toys that uh, used to be her little brothers. So uh, most of our dinosaurs, um, and we've got Rex over there, uh, who I brought from, from the States. Uh, most of these dinosaurs are from the 80s. They're, uh, most of them are, are 10, 20 years old. And um, we just had a box of them. And what I've found is that a lot of people have dinosaurs like this just lying around. And nobody really knows how they got them or where they came from or when they bought them. Um, but they have them. And uh, so Susan found these, and, and she just kind of on a whim set them up in the bathroom sink um, or, you know, around the faucet and uh, with some toothbrushes. And just you know, thinking maybe that the kids would wake up and they would go, you know, go to the bathroom to brush their teeth and they would see them and, and it would put a smile on their face. And there was really no grand plan. There was no vision for you know, some month-long project at the time. But what happened was um, the next morning we were in bed, groggy and, and sleepless. Um, and our, our, I guess she was four at the time, our daughter comes running in, and, Mom and Dad, you've got to come see, uh, come to the bathroom. The dinosaurs woke up last night and they were brushing their teeth. <laughs> and, you know, we kind of looked at each other and, and that, you know, we thought this is the solution to our problem. Um, and Dinovember was born. So um, we started... Uh, so, we, so when our daughter ran in and, and was so excited about the dinosaurs, um, you know, we knew that this was something that we wanted to do. And the dinosaurs <laughs> began to uh, come to life every night um, and, uh, and get into all sorts of different things. Um, 
here they are making a mess in the bathroom um, with the toilet paper. Uh, they got into the uh, leftover Halloween candy, uh, which our kids were very disappointed about until they realized that there was a pile of candy sitting out for them when they woke up in the morning. Um, and so then they felt a lot better about the dinosaurs messing with their stuff. Um, as time went on, <laughs> the dinosaurs started getting a little bit bolder, a little bit more creative. Um, you know, it, it, they, they started, instead of just destroying things, they started actually, um, you know, they had some, some creative endeavors. Um, here they are in what I can only imagine was some sort of art class. Um, the raptors, he's pretty good. Um, this is one of our, this was one of our daughter's favorite uh, discoveries. They woke up to find the, um, the dinosaurs having a tea party on the dining room table. And uh, searching for buried treasure in our air vents. And just so that, there, it, I feel like this picture provides good proof that this is really just our house. Because if you look, this is pretty nasty. <laughs> um, and we actually cleaned that a little bit before taking the picture. So um, we realized we should probably do that more often. Um, over time, because they, they are dinosaurs, um, they, uh, their, their antics started to escalate a little bit. And uh, yes, this is our living room wall. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and because we can't communicate with the dinosaurs, we're still not sure what Michelangelo did to deserve this. Um, it, it could be that you know, they felt a little bit insecure being around um, a more evolved version of themselves, but, uh, and a ninja, for that matter. So we did this for um, the month of November in 2012, and we started to share, uh, to take pictures and to share those pictures on Facebook, um, mostly because when we were talking about this, or when our kids were talking about this with friends and family who were, um, you know, maybe out of town, or um, you know, they, they you know, they, won't, they didn't quite get what we were talking about. Um, your, you know, your dinosaur toys are doing what? <laughs> so we started taking pictures and sharing them on Facebook as a way to help them to, uh, you know, just to help communicate what we're doing and help other people to, um, you know, uh, to, to be, put some visuals to it. Um, but, you know, people enjoyed them and, and kept asking for more and, um, and were disappointed when the month ended and we stopped. Um, the following year, uh, maybe two, three months before this past November of 2013, uh, our friends and family started asking us, you know, are you going to do it again? Are you going to do it again? So um, we, we decided that we would uh, start a, a Facebook page for it so that they'd all be in one place. And again, this was just for friends and family so that they could keep track of what we were doing. Um, and so there'd be kind of a central place where they could go and see the photos from last year and then, and then follow along as we continued to do it. Um, the second time around. Um, I wrote uh, a small article on medium.com. If you've ever um, heard of Medium, it's a great site for uh, writing, for blogging uh, or you know, writing pieces like this. It's got a built-in community and it's just a beautiful platform. Um, I've gotten to be uh, uh, quite impressed with, uh, with that company as things have moved forward with Dynavember and with that post. But, um, it was really just to get people up to speed who maybe weren't around the year before, new friends that we'd made throughout the year, uh, to kind of describe what exactly we were doing and why we were doing it, and to share some of the photos. Uh, at the time, when I was writing it, I felt like Medium was a safe place to do it because there really, it, it didn't seem like there were really too many people on it yet. It was still was, at the time, only about a year old. Um, it was still starting to kind of build this community. Um, but it was just a beautiful platform, a great place to share photos. Well, that, that isn't really what happened at all. Um, what happened was, over the course of the next two weeks, it was read by over uh, a million people and shared uh, over 11 million times. And we, uh, you know, I kept watching this and thinking, what in the world is going on? Why are so many people reading my little article about our toy dinosaurs. Um, 
And then over the next couple of weeks and throughout the month of November, the, our, the Facebook page grew to about a quarter million likes. Um, I think it's about uh, 265,000 right now. Um, and uh, you know, we were getting phone calls from the Today Show in Australia and the US and from uh, you know, German television and um, you know, people from all across the world who were seeing these and enjoying them. And um, it was something that was very unexpected for us, and it was certainly not our goal. We didn't set out to, uh, you know, to, to create this, uh, you know, this phenomenon or, or whatever it was. Um, but uh, our favorite thing about it was that, uh, you know, we invited people to participate and to share their, you know, to do this with their own kids and to share their photos on our Facebook page, and. Uh, and it was a lot of fun to see all of the, the cool stuff that people came up with. We received uh, thousands of photos. Uh, if you go to, Dynovember, uh, to uh, the Dynovember Facebook page, which is just facebook.com slash Dynovember, you can, see, you can still see all of the, the um, photos that were submitted by fans and, and people who are following along. This was by a woman named Patty Haas that we, we featured her as um, one of the days of, uh, of November. But we started hearing from parents who were doing this, and they were saying things like, you know, thank you for you know, giving us permission to be creative with, with our kids. And that was a really eye-opening moment for us because, you know, growing up, my dad is an illustrator. Um, you know, Susan and I have uh, always dabbled in, in various things. You know, my wife is a talented musician and, um, and uh, artist, and, and you know, we, it's just always been a part of our lives. But what we found was that a lot of people who don't consider themselves to be creatives, you know, maybe they're not, you know, officially doing a, you know, a creative skill or a, cre or a job in the creative field, they didn't feel like they were equipped to uh, foster that kind of an environment for their kids or to foster, you know, creative habits or creative thinking in their children. Um, which, you know, for us, you know, everybody should feel free to have fun with their kids and to make things up and, and do crazy things with the toys and whatever it is that they want to do, however it is that they want to express that with their children. Um, so that was a really eye-opening experience for us, but we had a lot of fun going through the photos that people submitted. Um, in talking with people about Dynavember and in preparing for this and, uh, and you know, doing some of the interviews that we've done, it, a lot of times, you know, we've had to really think, you know, why are people catch, you know, why is this caught on? You know, why are people interested in this? And I think that it goes back to what we were feeling when we started doing this in the first place, which is that, um, you know, we felt like we had kind of stagnated a little bit, uh, both with our kids and just as individuals, being tired and not having the energy to do fun things and to um, explore new possibilities and, and do, uh, creative projects like this, and I think that's where a lot of people are at. Um, you know, as our lives get busy and as we get older, um, we kind of lose some of that foundation that we had when we were kids, where we could be free to just um, play. And so, um, the, it's it's something that, as a parent, you know, when we look at our kids and we look at the the way that the world continues to change so quickly. Technology advances so rapidly. Culture is uh, you know, undergoing so many changes. It's a scary time to be a parent, if only, for, if only because it's hard to predict where things are going to be in 10, 15, 20 years when our kids are adults. You know, what is the world going to look like? Um, are, are we doing a good job of preparing them for that? Um, I think that the, it's comforting to know that every generation has felt that way. You know, our parents felt that way, their parents felt that way, everybody feels that way uh, about their kids. Everybody's worried about that for their kids. The only difference really is that now we have a much better understanding of what, uh, what imagination and what this kind of um, you know, imaginative play outside of um, the help that movies and games and, and all of these and, and technology, outside of the help that those things bring, just being able to play and, uh, and use our imaginations on our own. Understanding the role that that plays in, uh, in a child's life. I had the full quote. We had some technical difficulties, so I don't have my notes. But um, in this article, 
basically there were, uh, there was a lot of research that's been done recently uh, about the, the role of imagination, how important it is as a child begins to make sense of the world around them. It's something that helps them to fill in the gaps of their own observations and experience. Um, for young kids, everything is new. Every experience that they have is the first time that they've had that experience uh, until a certain age. And if you think about that, it's, it's really remarkable because that's so different than, than it is for us at, at our age, if you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s or, or beyond. We have to start working harder and harder to have new experiences. We have to go to new places. We have to fly overnight to Norway. Um, <laughs> You know, we have to really try to seek these things out. But as a kid, everything is new. Everything is potentially amazing. Uh, and it's something that they don't have to look for. It. They just have to be willing to, um, to go through those experiences. And what puts the pieces together for them is their ability to see past what it is that they're experiencing in that moment and, and to make these kinds of connections with things that are really very much still unknown. Um, so, the, the imagination is what allows us to look at history and to make sense of things that have happened before our time. It's something that allows us to, um, you know, kind of look into the future and see the possibilities that are ahead of us. It's something that is integral in having hope, I think, and, um, and to be able to, uh, you know, to take these pieces that, that these children are acquiring and that we are acquiring as adults, these experiences, and putting them together and creating something new. Um, but hope, you know, going through difficult circumstances and dealing with a world that we don't understand, and, and especially as children, as we're, as we're um, moving through life and having to go through new challenges, uh, imagination is what allows us to have hope. And children, it's very easy for them to, you know, as a parent, when, you're, when something happens to your child, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to comfort them. Uh, you know, they trust their parents, you know, hopefully, um, and when we tell them, you know, it's going to be okay, you, you know, you're going to feel better, they believe us because they're able to look past what's happening the, the, to them at that moment and to be able to see a point where, um, where things are better, they feel better, their scraped knees healed, whatever, whatever challenge this, you know, their pet has died or they've lost their favorite toy, they can see past that and imagine uh, a world where that pain is gone and that discomfort is gone and there are, you know, new things to be excited about. But the most important thing for us, um, you know, because Dine November and what we're trying to do with our own kids and now because it's something that has kind of uh, moved on to an international stage, um, you know, what we're trying to promote with other people and their kids is really just such a small part of that. I mean, it's plastic dinosaurs um, who get into trouble. And, but the thought behind it, I think, is something that um, is, is really just a very foundational uh, desire for our kids to grow up with that sense of wonder and to be able to hold on to that as, as long as possible. When our kids see their parents, you know, um, spending this time and taking these pictures and talking with them about what their dinosaurs did last night, they're seeing us engage with them on a level where I mean, we're you know, we're basically we're basically playing with toys all the time now, <laughs> um, and it's something that is fun for them, and it and it shows them that even when they grow up, they don't have to give up on those things. They don't have to stop playing. They don't have to stop uh, using their imaginations and using their creativity to come up with fun things to do and to make their lives um, and the lives of those around them more fun and more interesting and all piece of it. But we like to think that, that it's part of what uh, is allowing our children to continue to, um, to develop in that way. Our six-year-old is becoming quite a little artist. Um, she has a grandpa who helps her with that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's amazing to see what our two daughters come up with. I think that there is some artwork on the wall from some local kids who have um, put their drawings. I think there's going to be something uh, with that later. But um, 
But that's really what is giving us the energy to, to do this for our kids and to spend the time talking about this and traveling around talking about this. Um, and uh, hopefully, I know that it looked like most of the hands went up when I asked if people had seen that number before. Hopefully that is what you're getting out of it and, uh, and what has kind of helped you to, uh, to enjoy these, uh, these uh, plastic dinosaurs with us. I brought Rex with me, um, and so he's having, he's having some coffee. He's a little jet lag too. So um, if, uh, if anybody wants to uh, play with him later, he's, he's available. Um, getting him through, uh, through customs and everything, we, uh, I tried to take a picture of him going through the x-ray, uh, but uh, the TSA agent I got very upset with me for trying to do that. So, um, so I don't have that, but um, I wasn't trying to smuggle anything in with him. Um, but, uh, um, so anyway, here is facebook.com slash sign where you can see all the photos. Uh, we will actually be um, publishing uh, a book of the photos uh, this coming October, November time internationally. Um, so it should be available in Norway from, from what I understand. Snowstorm, yeah. <laughs> um, but thank you for having me. I really appreciate all you coming out this early in the morning and showing up and hearing me talk. I apologize. My notes, I didn't have my notes, so I, I probably missed plenty of things and rambled towards the end there. But um, but uh, again, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me in Oslo and uh, helping me trudge through the snow. Um, and uh, I hope that you guys all get a chance to draw something. And, uh, have some breakfast, and thank you very much to the Creative Mornings team for having me.